I believe that Buffalo Bill Cody's interest in the movies began in Paris in 1889 when he met Thomas Edison there. Both celebrities had been invited to the same soiree and Edison was there for the exposition Universelle. He was very excited about having just sort of perfected his uh, phonograph. Cody was there with his Wild West show and invited Edison to an American style breakfast at the Wild West camp. In the afternoon performance of the Wild West show, Edison rode around the Deadwood, in the Deadwood stage around the arena. Cody and Edison met again in Chicago in 1893 when Chicago hosted the World's Columbian Exposition and both men attended that. The Wild West Show performed frequently in New Jersey where workers had completed the first motion picture studio. They called it the Black Mariah. Edison, um, after he had invented the kinetoscope, needed more films for it. So he would ask anyone, any performer, to come and perform before the camera, be they acrobats or dancers or magicians. And he may have invited Cody to come and shoot before the camera, or it may have been Cody's idea as publicity for his upcoming European tour. Either way, Edison was also pleased to film the show's Indians because they were also popular entertainers. So on September 24th, 1894, Cody and several members of the Brule and Ogallala tribes arrived at the Black Mariah. Cody started the demonstration with some rapid shooting. Edison had wanted to ascertain if the, uh, his camera was sensitive enough to follow the flight of a bullet, and so this is why he asked Cody to bring his rifle and do some shooting. Uh, Cody was most likely filmed by Edison's assistant, W.K.L. Dixon. Many, many years later, in the 1890s or 19, I mean, 1980s, uh, Edison historian Ray Phillips found in Dixon's book that was titled History of the Kinetograph, Kinetoscope, and Kinetophonograph, 16 frames of film that show Cody shooting and reloading and shooting again as he did in 1894. So through some miracle of modern movie making, Ray Phillips and some of his colleagues were able to take those 16 frames, put them on modern film, and run them through a projector. And what they saw was Cody shooting and reloading and shooting again, as he did in, 18, in 1894. Then it was the Indians' turn on the Black Mariah stage. I hope that, there we are. Um, the constraints of performing on a stage that was about 12 feet square makes them appear to be unnaturally crunched together. And you can see that there were three dancers and two drummers in the background. In, uh, they're doing something that was called the Buffalo Dance. It was called the Buffalo Dance by the press. It was not necessarily what the Indians had called it. Another group of Indians did something they called the Ghost Dance, which was also named by the press, probably because the Ghost Dance had been in the news only four years previously. You'll also notice that the film, which it runs about two minutes in total, is kind of dark. That could be for two reasons. One, that by the time the film was discovered, it had already begun to decompose. Also, it could have been a cloudy day on the day that they filmed it. Edison did not have Klieg lights like they do nowadays to light up the scene. So he had to rely on the retractable roof of the Black Mariah. It was a sunny day, then sun streamed in through the roof and lit up the stage. If it was a cloudy day, it didn't. So Edison and other filmmakers like the Pathé brothers and the Lumiere brothers continued to improve the moving picture camera and projector and often practiced on Wild Bill show, the Buffalo Bill show. Um, Let's see if this is going to work. We've got some scenes. This is from Life on the Ranch. And this is the Indians, and you'll see the Deadwood stage come into view. <coughs> Let's 
Now we're going to fast forward to 1907. This was a watershed year for Cody and his Wild West. The country was in hard times, and so was Cody's Wild West show. He had made some bad investments, and Don Russell, his biographer, said of Cody, nothing that he touched outside of show business ever made him any money, yet those ventures cost him the most. Movies were a big competition for Cody. Movies were really coming into their own. Four years previously, Edison had filmed The Great Train Robbery, which was one of the first Westerns with real cowboys and a real fictional plot filmed in the real wilds of New Jersey. <laughs> Movies were also used for recruitment for the Army, and they were used as training for immigrants to teach them English. And viewers audiences were becoming more discriminatory. They didn't care for just any old film anymore. They knew what they wanted to see, and if they didn't like it, they walked out. Another competition for Cody was the Miller brothers. George Miller and his sons worked thousands of acres on an Oklahoma ranch when they decided to branch out into show business. They called themselves the Miller Brothers 101 Show. And not only were they usurping Cody's Wild West arena business, but they offered their ranch as a site for location films. And then, whereas Cody paid to idle his Wild West show over the winters, the New York Motion Picture Company set up the Millers in California so that they could film year round. So by this time, between the phenomenon of the movies and the Miller brothers, the competition was killing Cody. He was 64 years of age, and he should have been thinking about retirement, but he needed more money. So he explained to his partner, Pawnee Bill Lilly, his idea that if they announced that the Wild West show was going to be done, they were leaving show business, getting out of the whole affair, that if they traveled the country one more time and showed in every city, that they could probably make a million dollars every season because people would be anxious to see them for the very last time. So, they went on some farewell tours. Learning of the plan to close the show, a man named Pliny Craft, who was an agent of the Patrick Powers Motion Picture Company, approached Pawnee Bill Lilly on the showgrounds at Williamsport, Pennsylvania in May 1910. He had $1,000 in his hand and predicted that there would be a lot more where that came from if he and his company would be allowed to film the two bills. They didn't even have to appear in the film. If they did, that would be great. If they didn't, their names alone would enhance the value of the film. And again, if they didn't, look-alike stand-ins could take their parts. So the men hammered out an agreement, and that put Kraft and Powers in business as the Buffalo Bill and Pawnee Bill Film Company. They were going to make two films. One would include the entire Wild West show, and the second would chronicle Cody's life. So to direct the first, he hired Paul Panzer. Panzer would later become famous as Pearl White's co-star in The Perils of Pauline. And he was doing fairly well at the job of directing when his wife became ill, and he was forced to leave the job. So they turned the job of directing over to Johnny Baker, who was Cody's right-hand man. And he was a good man for the job because he knew the Wild West and, and could just do a good job at it. So these are some of the scenes that were shot for this film. Here we, whoop, I knew I was going to do that. There's football on horseback. And where are we going here? There's the entire Wild West cast. And this is a still shot from the segment of Life on the Ranch. Kraft advertised the resulting documentary as Buffalo Bill Bids You Goodbye, quote, the last chance to see the old scout 
as presented in the farewell performances of the most wonderful exhibition ever presented to the public. The 1911 Wild West season began with a bang, but Cody faced increasing competition from the Miller brothers when they started to play towns on the circuit before he got there. So by the time the Wild West pulled into town, audiences were not always so willing to see another Wild West show. But meanwhile, Kraft and Powers continued their plan to film Cody's life in a popular format known as a biopic. And it's just exactly what it sounds like, a picture made of the biography of a real person. And sometimes filmmakers would include events that maybe had not occurred in the life of that real person. For this, they offered John O'Brien the job of directing. He was a former SNA actor, and he was doing a pretty good job of it too. Um, his one challenge in particular was to keep the show, uh, he had to continually keep with, with continually cope with moving locations as the Wild West moved from city to city. The film is called The Life of Buffalo Bill, and this is the one you're going to see upstairs later. It opens with Cody riding through a stream in a wooded area, and he might be looking for Indians or wildlife, or since it's called, this segment is called The Colonel Takes a Holiday, maybe he's looking for a motel that'll take his horse. <laughs> But always, 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 Cody was about authenticity. So if this was going to be a story of his life, he wanted to be in it. And he is at the beginning and at the end. Um, in about a couple seconds, he pulls into a clearing where he takes the saddle off the horse and the saddle blanket, lays down on the blanket, and takes a nap. What he dreams is the memories that he had as a young man. Now, the filmmakers could not have this elder Cody playing a younger Cody. It would just be too confusing. And so they hired a younger actor to play Cody in the middle part of the film. And he's the one who does all the adventuresome stuff. You'll see him in a minute. They dressed the younger actor in a black, long black wig and a um, same jacket as, and boots as Cody is wearing here. And here we have the younger Cody awakening from a nap. Now, is it just me, or is this younger Cody just not as coordinated <laughs> as the real Cody? <laughs> Kraft promoted the film with some colorful posters. And he also advertised in Moving Picture World. That was the journal or the newspaper for uh, movie exhibitors. It would tell what movies were about to be released, the plot of them, how long they were, the stars, and so on. And this is the ad that appeared in, where's the ad? There it is, in Moving Picture World in May 1912. Part of it says, these pictures are not a reproduction of Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, not a lurid so-called Western drama, but the true story of a useful life. And from James Fenimore Cooper, we learn through books the early Western life, but by Buffalo Bill, the world was given the actual sight of it. Meanwhile, back at the Wild West show, the 1912 season that Cody had hoped would show profits of a million dollars only showed receipts for $125,000. Cody wrote his cousin, I'm trying to get out of show business. I am compelled to work sick or well and at 67, it is harder to pull myself together than it was 30 years ago. And ain't that the truth? Enter 
Frederick Bonfies and Harry Tammen. These were two businessmen from Denver who owned the Denver Post and a small entertainment known as the Sells Floto Circus. When Cody met them in January 1913, he most certainly mentioned his pressing need for cash. The two of them jumped on it and offered him a $20,000 loan in exchange for his services and basically his entire Wild West show. The Denver Post called it the most important deal ever consummated in American amusement enterprise. These two rascally scoundrels got Cody lock, stock, and barrel to appear with their Sells Floto Circus. The Denver Post also predicted that the Sells Floto would become, quote, the finest and largest organization of its kind when joined next year by Buffalo Bill's show. As the year went on, Cody fell deeper and deeper into debt, despite the $20,000 loan. He and Lily had been warned not to take the show into Denver because creditors would most certainly try to get their money back. But they did not heed the warning and paraded the Wild West into Denver's Union Park on July 21st, 1913. Sure enough, the next day, the show was attached for non-payment and Buffalo Bill was bankrupt. Why am I going to cry? <laughs> Cody said to a, a friend, after nearly 30 years, the old show went out of business on the 22nd. It nearly broke my heart. But he also said, I am not down and out by a long jump. So instead of taking the opportunity to retire, as maybe he should have, Cody decided in a sort of, if you can't beat them, join them moment, to make a moving picture that would not be just a fictional plot or not just recorded scenes from a Wild West show. Just like uh, authors are told to write what you know, Cody decided to film what he knew. And what he knew best was war and Indians. He decided to film his true life experiences with the Army and with the Indians. He had one more chance, he figured, to tell his settlement, his story of the settlement of the West. It could be his legacy. So he picked three outstanding battles to portray, Summit Springs, War Bonnet Creek, and the Battle of Wounded Knee. In July 1869, Cody had been acting as the 5th Cavalry's Chief of Scouts. The uh, Cheyenne Chief, Tall Bull, had been going on some raids, and one of his final ones was to abduct two women from Kansas. General Philip Sheridan, who was the military commander at the time, ordered the 5th to get those women back and do whatever you have to do to the Indians to accomplish that. So Cody led the 5th Cavalry to Summit Springs, where he, according to his version, killed the Indian Tall Bull, and there you see him in a reenactment rescuing one of the women. Three weeks after the fall of Custer, the 5th Cavalry was again being led by its chief scout, William F. Cody, when they encountered Cheyenne heading north to join Sitting Bull Sioux. They expected to confront them at War Bonnet Creek and set up an ambush. And there, Cody confronted an Indian named Yellow Hair. There are several versions of the story. Cody's version is that he and Yellow Hair had a hand-to-hand -hand knife fight. Cody killed the Indian, scalped him, held the scalp aloft and cried, first scalp for Custer. In 1890, Paiute spiritual leader Wovoka preached to the Indians that if they just wore ghost shirts, danced a ghost dance, when the soldiers inevitably came again, their bullets would not harm the Indians. Instead, the soldiers would die, green grass would grow over them, and the land would revert to the Indians. That's not exactly the way it happened. In the resulting clash, several hundred Indians were killed. Cody was not there for the battle itself, but was on site several weeks later where he was able to hire some of the ghost dance prisoners to travel with his Wild West show. So with a plan in mind to bring the history of the Indian Wars to the movies, Cody needed three specific things to fall into place. Financial assistance, which he got from Harry Tammen, 
who I suspect sold off some of the Wild West stuff and then gave the money back to Cody. Or maybe not, since Tamman was such a devil. Uh, he wanted original participants. As I said, Cody was all about authenticity. So if he could get a, a military commanders who had been um, in the field during those battles, he wanted them to participate in his film. He also wanted Indians from Pine Ridge Reservation. Some of them had been in the original battles, particularly Wounded Knee, and some of them had ancestors who had been. Also, he needed government permissions to use Indians in the reenactment and cavalry. So, don't change. Okay. So when Secretary of Interior Franklin Lane came to Cody for another reason, uh, Cody approached him, when he came to Wyoming, uh, Cody approached him about uh, allowing the Indians on Pine Ridge Reservation to help him reenact the film. When Secretary of War came to Wyoming for, again, another purpose, he asked um, Secretary Garrison about using a cavalry unit. The 7th Cavalry had been involved with the Wounded Knee, but Garrison approved the 12th Cavalry out of Fort Robinson, which was the closest to the Pine Ridge Reservation. As for filmmaker, Tamman and Cody chose SNA because they had been making uh, authentic westerns for at least the last five years, and George Spool, Spoor was a fan of Cody's, so SNA was a good choice. So in October 1913, and if you count back, we're, we're looking at like three or four months that Cody got all this together. Cody, the military commanders, the SNA cameramen, Indians from the surrounding territories, and Fort Robinson soldiers all converged on Pine Ridge Reservation. Johnny Baker, Cody's right-hand man, briefed the Indians on why they were doing a reenactment and how the Indians' participation would really help make it uh, authentic. And he tried to calm their fears that a second wounded knee was about to occur. Because you can imagine their fears when the Indians saw the soldiers come with their Hotchkiss guns and their rifles. They thought they were about to be annihilated by the 12th Cavalry as their ancestors had been by the 7th Cavalry. Part of the blame for their concern lies right at the feet of General Nelson Miles, who Cody had hired for the film as a technical advisor. Miles was even more insistent on authenticity than Cody was, and he insisted that they film the battle scenes right over the victims' graves. So, despite all of this, the filmmaking went very well except when the Indians that were supposed to be dead rolled over to watch the rest of the battle. <laughs> so besides the three battles that Cody had initially planned, they also reenacted the ghost dance, and the film shows some um, scalping and some burning of camps and teepees by the soldiers, and some more dances. And then in order to satisfy the government, who if this was going to be in the government archives, you had to satisfy the government, um, Cody had to show the wonderful progress that the Indians had made under the government's beneficence. So he had some school children going to modern schools and he showed some Indian farmers bringing in their crops. Now there, there are only three minutes of the film that survived, so I want to show you just a little bit of those three minutes. That's Cody, and he's 67. And isn't that great that they have the binocular effect? In 1913. Ah, uh, yes, this is Colonel Sickles next to him.
Besides the film, there were many, many still photographs taken at the time of the filming. These are a few of those. Here's director Theodore Wharton from SNA walking the grounds with Nelson Miles. We've got Cody leading some cavalry members. And I apologize for the poor quality of this picture. Um, this was taken from a newspaper, a photocopy of a newspaper. This was a, a tower that Theodore Wharton had built and then roped onto a farm wagon. So the cameraman at the very top could get an even greater overview of the battle scenes. Also, he could be pulled along as the action moved. A few weeks later, when Wharton had finally completed the filming, he had nearly 30,000 feet of film in the film canisters that contained pictures of over 3,000 men, women, and horses in action that extended over miles. Wharton took the negatives back to Chicago, <clears throat> and Cody headed back to Wyoming, where he prepared a lecture to accompany the film. This was a common practice of the day where um, maybe the star or somebody important connected with the film would travel around the cities with the film. And as the projectionist changed the reels, this person would talk about maybe how they had done a special effect or um, how they came to be a star in the film, something like that. <clears throat> On the 26th of February, Cody's birthday, he first showed the film to military people who had been in the film and also to the financial backers. The next day's showing was very important. It was for the government officials. President Woodrow Wilson had been invited to attend, but he was unable to. But many cabinet members and congressmen attended. This was very important because they were the ones who would decide the value of the film and whether it should be included in the government archives. As for the film going public, um, it was speculated that the film would debut in New York City. But Cody, most certainly pressured by Harry Tamman, finally decided that the pictures must have their premiere in the West in the city that had made it possible for all this to be accomplished. So beginning March 8, 1914, the film showed in Denver's Tabor Opera House twice daily for a week. And then, between the reels, as the projectionist was changing the reels, Cody galloped into the theater on a horse wearing the same outfit that he had in the film, got up on stage and said something like, boy, how about those battles? You know, we really showed them. And there's one more coming up, so I hope you're comfortable. Stay seated. And you can imagine the astonishment of the audience. What if you were watching Pirates of the Caribbean and Johnny Depp came sashaying into the theater? I, they sat there open-mouthed until finally they just applauded. Amazing. Once the uh, critics got to see the film, they were uh, pretty positive with their reviews. They called it awesome, showed gruesome reality. It was very authentic, showed splendid drama. But there was one film critic <clears throat> who, in his review, gives us an idea of the very graphic nature of the film and how very authentic Cody had made it. He also tells us how um, emotional the film made people in the audience. He says, in part, as the Hotchkiss guns mowed down the Indians, the man near me sucked the breath from between teeth and muttered, my God. Another clapped his hand across his mouth to stifle a sob. Somebody groaned. As the on-screen Indians chose to fight rather than retreat, the battle scenes reflected an afternoon of methodical wholesale killing. I heard a man praying in whispers. We had them lined up against a wall, and we were pounding them to pieces. Sometimes they formed and came charging down the hillside to the ravine as though thus to hasten death. And each time they charged, our gunner found the range, and they halted and spun around and fell as a stone falls when a shell burst above them. It was killing reduced to a business. A man gritted his teeth and muttered, my God, why don't they surrender? 
As if answering him, the bugle sounded, cease firing. The film was most often known as the Indian Wars, but sometimes exhibitors renamed it in order to appeal to their audiences. So you could also find the film under these names. Now I said that the film debuted in March 1914, and only a year later I could find very little news of it. Uh, it was not a commercial success that Cody had hoped for, and there are several reasons for this. One, it was World War I time, the war to end all wars. And if people went to the theater expecting to see a war film, what they wanted to see was a film from the European theater, not Indian wars that had been over with for a quarter century. There were 4,200 other films released that year, so quite a lot of competition. There was a new music called Ragtime. People wanted to go to uh, dance or listen to music. They could listen to a brand new music called jazz. Vaudeville continued to show a mixed bag of entertainment from singers and dancers to magicians and comedians and just all kinds of entertainments. Another factor was the length of Cody's film. It ranged from five to six to eight reels depending on which segments they showed and what they left out for any particular showing. This ranged from maybe an hour and a quarter to two and a half hours. Now that doesn't sound very long to us today, but if you had to sit on chairs like this, it probably was a very long time. So why do we have only three minutes surviving now? A theory has been bandied about that once the government officials got to see it and had second thoughts about it, they thought maybe it was too authentic and showed too graphically exactly what the military had been doing out there and it did not show the military in a very favorable light. And so somebody probably said, we don't have to destroy this, just somebody please stick it in your bottom drawer and you know we just won't talk about this anymore. Another reason we could only have a few minutes of it is that it was processed on nitrate film. Nitrate film was very flammable, and so the projectionist had to be careful to keep it moving past the projection lamp, just so it wouldn't catch on fire. Also, nitrate film is very decomposable. Whether that takes 10 years, or 30 years, or 50 years, it will decompose, turning into a gooey mass which dries to a, a dry powder. So Cody was not successful as a movie maker. But after his death, Movie makers continued to use his life and legend in their films, and these are just a few of them. Um, and even if they did not have a specific Cody character in their film, they may have said that the film took place in the days of Buffalo Bill or at the time that Cody lived. So uh, these are just a few of those, and I want to show you just uh, some clips from a couple of them. This is from 1931. This is Tom Tyler in Battling Buffalo Bill. Uh, the Indians have kidnapped a frontier woman, and there's Buffalo Bill. He's off to the rescue. In 1940, Roy Rogers played a young Buffalo Bill. What are you doing? I'm trying to calm these runaways. Well, thank you just the same, but they're not runaways. I'm in a hurry. But I thought that... I don't care what you thought. Will you please get down off my horses? You know, that's the prettiest rescue I ever saw. You know, you were lucky, young woman, to have a fellow like Bill Cody ride along when your horse is busted loose. Why, he's the greatest buffalo hunter in the state of Kansas. But I'm not a buffalo. Snake. 
raggedy women. I'm proud of it. Uh, in 1944, Joel McRae played Buffalo Bill, and in this scene, he contradicts the notion that Indians are not good people. Believe like General Sherman that the only good Indian is a dead Indian. We have here tonight a guest who knows more about the frontier than any man living, and who, if we hold with General Sherman, has made more good Indians than any other man in the West. Mr. President... Ladies and gentlemen, Buffalo Bill. Get it slowly, don't get nervous. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I was afraid I was going to make a fool of myself in front of you tonight, but that would have been all right. Because a man can make a fool of himself when he's off his own stamping ground. But when a man makes a fool of himself on his own stamping ground, there's no excuse for him. I don't hold with General Sherman that a good Indian is a dead Indian. From what I've seen, the Indian is a freeborn American who'll fight for his folks, for his land, and for his living, just like any other American. Holy Jupiter, this is dynamite! If you knew the Indians, if you could see them for yourselves, how they live against nature with nothing but their bare hands, you'd never force them to break treaties to keep from starving. But the trouble is, you Easterners don't know what you're doing. And that's why... We 30 years later, Roy Huggins, who was famous for creating the Maverick series and Rockford Files, created a satirical version of the legends of Wild Bill Hickok and Buffalo Bill Cody. The script of This is the West That Was calls for Cody, who is played by Matt Clark, you can see him there, to be an inept wannabe who was very jealous of Hickok's gunfighter reputation. And I need to tell you that this is the film that got me started on my research into Wild Bill Hickok and then eventually into Buffalo Bill Cody. If you know anything about those two Frontierman, it's a wonderful show because he just satirizes the devil out of their legends. And uh, it's a very funny movie. If you can ever catch it, do. You may only be able to catch it on some late night movie channel that's very obscure. But uh, if you do, it's a very funny film to see. Uh, in this particular uh, segment I want to show you, Cody has just challenged Hickok to a showdown. I guess we best take our differences out in the street. Shoot up less furniture and bystanders that way. Well, that's fine with me. Let's go. Your mother's still alive, Cody. Yeah. Why? Because we're going to drink a toast to the poor woman that's about to lose a son. Commonly another glass here. Some other time, Hickok. I believe the point is there ain't going to be another time. I pass. I'm proposing a toast to your mother. And you pass? That's what I said. Where are you from, Cody? Scott County, Iowa. Well, I don't know what kind of man they raise in Scott County, Iowa. Any place I ever been, a man don't pass in a drink when his own mother's being toasted. Well, here's to that poor bereaved woman and to the lasting memory of her foolish son. Here's to the proud mother of the man who killed Wild Bill Hickok. At what they call a two-fisted drinker in Scott County, Iowa? You know what kind of men sip whiskey where I come from? The kind you see carrying an umbrella on a sunny day. Hold it, Cody. 
we drink to your mother, it's only fitting we drink to mine. Well, now, I was wondering if you had one. Well, I do. And I've never failed to lift a glass to her health before sending a man off to his just reward. It's a tradition, so to speak. You ought to drink to his mother, Tom. You ought to drink to her before you die. It's Bill! Bill Cody! And after today, it's a name you won't ever forget. You ready yet, Hickok? Wait a minute, wait a minute, don't push me. You want to drink too now, Ulysses S. Grant? Well, you brought it up, Cody. Maybe you'd like to drink to U.S. Grant. Yeah, I would. Now there's a man. Here's to you, listen. In case you haven't get, guessed, Cody gets dead drunk and falls down. <clears throat> Two years later, Robert Altman, who made it a point to debunk heroes, legends, picked on Cody in Buffalo Bill and the Indians or Sitting Bull's history lesson. Paul Newman, who played Cody in this one, said of Cody in an interview, he was like one of those people in motion pictures who simply cannot live up to their legends. Their legends are created for them. They are simply human beings, flawed. Now in this scene, Ned Buntline reminds Cody of what a great man he really is. All to climb. You got everything you ever wanted, my friend. You even got the President of the United States sleeping in your bed right now. Let's forget all that stuff, Ned, and get drunk. I can't forget it, Bill. Just looking at you reminds me of it. To live it. Oh, no. Way past the living. Why, a hundred years from now, they'll still be shouting your name. You're not one of the boys no more, Bill. You're not like ordinary folk. Why, it gives me goosebumps just being this close to you. You still got the knack. In 1989, uh, Cody was on the television as a young rider for the Pony Express, played by Stephen Baldwin, and you can see him there on the right. Throughout his public career, William Frederick Cody, whether from his stage careers, to his Wild West show, to his film The Indian Wars, his goal was to show the West and its peoples to those of us not privileged to live here. That he did this is his legacy. And so, his legend lives on. Happy birthday, Buffalo Bill. Thank you.